Thank you, Cheryl. And uh, thanks, Chris, for uh, joining us here today as well. Uh, it's good to have you back again. Pleasure to be here. So uh, today's topic uh, uh, is sort of the, the, the flip side or the other side of a topic that we did uh, not too long ago, which was um, IT basics for audio professionals. Uh, because as the, the, the buzzword that gets thrown around the industry that people like to use is convergence, meaning that IT and audio are merging. Uh, a lot of audio products that are coming out now are digital in nature and rely on some sort of an IT backbone or Ethernet communication in order to communicate with other devices and for setup and operation and communication and all that sort of thing. And then on the flip side of that, in a lot of uh, corporations and businesses and other places, the management and deployment and operation of the audiovisual equipment is becoming something that the IT department is responsible for. Uh, they no longer is just a standalone audiovisual department or it's not necessarily run by you know facilities. It's actually kind of coming under the the IT umbrella. And if you know if you're lucky, maybe you have an AV person on staff that knows this, or maybe you don't, and you have to learn all this stuff now. So what we thought we would do is kind of take a real sort of back to basics approach from the audio side of it today for for uh, you know people who don't have the the background or the experience in it. So if you if you signed up for this with a strong audio background already, a little this might be a little bit of a review for you, although review never hurts. Um, but yeah, this is going to go kind of from the sort of from the ground up. Some things you might need to know about audio to uh, you know effectively uh, manage a sound system. So let's get right into it. Uh, we'll start with what the purpose of a sound system is. It seems you know like most people would say, well, it's to make it louder, right? But And then that is it more or less a, a short uh, way of saying it, but you, you can define it a little bit more uh, a little bit more than that. And the purpose of a sound system, and we'll talk about the different types in a minute, are to provide audibility, intelligibility, and fidelity. And th what those terms mean is audibility is really just kind of like, you know, the joke is to make it loud enough, right? To, to provide something that you can hear in an environment when you normally wouldn't able to be able to hear at an adequate level so it makes it makes whatever it needs to be audible for you intelligibility makes is to make sure that it is intelligible that is understandable that you know can can tell what's going on i mean you could you could have a lot of level that doesn't have a lot of audibility without intelligibility but especially for the purpose of a speech based system where communication is what is trying to happen, if it's not intelligible, doesn't really do you any good. So the audibility and the intelligibility kind of go hand in hand. And then fidelity just kind of refers more to how, how good does it sound or what is, the, what is the quality of the sound, particularly in a more, maybe more of a music-based system where it has to be full of range or more concerned with, you know, making it sound quote unquote good. And we could probably debate for hours about what that is. But there's, you know, there's a certain amount of fidelity that you're trying to achieve with the sound system. And how much fidelity you need depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, and that also depends on whether it's for speech or music. And so sound systems can have different purposes and the requirements for either one might be slightly different. Most of what we're going to be talking about here today is really for speech-based um, systems, which again would have a different set of requirements where intelligibility is the primary thing that you're concerned with, whereas in a music-based system, the fidelity might be more what you're concerned about. So, you know, that you have to consider the application of the sound system. But in the immortal words of Don Davis, founder of one of the best training uh, organizations in the audio business, if bad sound were fatal, audio would be the leading cause of death. So, but we're going to try and remedy that as much as we can. Yes. So um, different types of sound systems, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but um, it does uh, give you uh, an idea of the different kind of applications you might use a sound system for. Of course, sound reinforcement, conferencing, teleconferencing, audio conferencing, video conferencing, web conferencing, whatever you want to call it, recording, and uh, streaming. So let's start with sound reinforcement. Yeah, now the room that we see there on the screen is, is a fairly typical training room or, or a distance learning classroom maybe, uh, but that's a, a classic sound reinforcement system where you got one presenter or instructor up at the front of the room and then participants uh, seated in those rows there in, in concentric circles. Now the key thing here is that um, in, in this type of room, it can take a couple of different uh, approaches. One is the classic style is a one-to-many type sound system where the person doing the talking is the person up in front and the people seated in the audience aren't really participating by talking very much. They might ask a question once in a while, 
but not very often. Whereas in some situations, like maybe distance learning or some sort of an organizational committee meeting or something, everybody in the audience might be a participant. And we call that a many-to-many -many sound system. And sometimes those are arranged a little bit differently because now it's a lot more important uh, that each of those participants can be heard just as well as the main participant up front. And those people need to be able to hear each other clearly in all directions. Someone on the left side of the room has to be able to hear the person on the right side of the room, not just the person down in front. And those two types of rooms sometimes take a little bit different format, but uh, the same basic general practices apply either way. But sound reinforcement is, is sort of uh, the primary purpose of many sound systems. And then conferencing. Now, when you talk about conferencing, now uh, it's it's still sort of like a sound reinforcement system, except the person listening is actually at a remote location. So the microphones on the table in this photo here, clearly they're only for the people in this room to be heard by the folks at the other location, because these folks are all sitting close enough together that no sound system is required. So the microphones transmit their sound to the far site. Microphones on the table at that location pick up those participants and then that's played back into this room through loudspeakers. Some of the same problems and challenges apply as a sound reinforcement system, but because we've now sort of split the system to two locations, some of the things are a little bit different. And then we talk about recording and streaming, which are actually uh, fairly similar. Uh, you know, there's no live audio loop at this point point where um, you know you might be listening to it but the, the the audio is all in one direction so you've got one source and then a destination whether it's going to a recorder and somebody's listening to it later or maybe in the case of streaming where they might be listening live or they might be listening after a delay or might be listening five days later we don't know uh, and it could be five people listening or five million people. You know, that depends on the type of system and the, and the way it's arranged. Uh, but in this case, we still want great audio quality, but uh, we don't need to worry as much about uh, some of the factors um, that affect more of a live audio system with sound reinforcement or conferencing. The common denominator here with recording and streaming is the computer. Ultimately, no matter which, which one of these activities you're doing, you're ultimately going to be needing to get audio into your computer. And computers, uh, for the most part, are not designed to interface with professional audio equipment uh, directly, at least. You require, you know, use some sort of an interface, and we'll kind of talk about what some of those challenges are in a little bit, but just be aware it's not necessarily as simple as, you know, heading down to the local music store, buying a microphone, and plugging it into your computer if you want to do web streaming. So there's some right. other things that you need to consider there. There are some single microphones designed for direct connection to a computer, but those typically aren't intended for use in a larger scenario where you got a dozen people around a table or something like that. Exactly. So let's just talk a little bit about what sound waves are. Um, you know, we're, we're even though the uh, audio business has got more digital equipment in it and is moving more digital, we're still dealing with analog waveforms to start with. So, um, and it all comes back to physics again. Physics governs the laws of how these waves behave and you know we can't, uh, at least to this point, we can't override the laws of physics yet. Um, but a sound wave, if, again for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is nothing more than uh, pressure, air pressure variations that, that travel through the air. So when I when I speak or when Chris speaks or when my computer fan makes noise, whatever it happens to be is causing uh, compression and rarefraction of the air molecules. So the air molecules get closer together and then they get further apart and then they get closer together and they get further apart and that creates a sound wave that then travels through a medium, could be air, could be water, it has to be some sort of medium, it can't travel through the vacuum of space, but that sound wave then, then propagates in that matter and shares uh, properties that any other uh, any other wave would have, including um, amplitude, which dictates how how loud it is. Basically, has referred to the the amplitude of the wave that is created from whatever the sound source happens to be, and then wavelength, which is the physical size that that the wave one full cycle of the wave takes to propagate, 
and that's usually specified in, in Hertz and you'll see that uh, in when you were talking about the frequency response or frequency range or whatever you have of a, of a sound system and these are you know good things to sort of keep in mind when we're talking about frequencies um, you have to remember how the waves may encounter may behave when they encounter a, a particular solid object for example so if you have uh, high frequencies have shorter wavelengths and shorter wavelengths can be blocked by smaller objects so if I put my hand in front of my mouth you'll notice a dramatic difference in what the sound quality sounds like because I'm using my hand to physically block that wave whereas longer wavelengths um, tend to bend around objects a little bit more easily and you don't have to worry about obstructions but then in certain kinds of rooms they lower frequencies are harder to control and can cause other types of problems and standing waves and things like that so you know you do have to kind of be aware of these things and, and sort of keep them in mind when we're talking about uh, wavelength as it relates to frequency again here this chart on the top here you can see sort of the frequency range of various various musical instruments but for our purposes when we're talking about speech you can kind of look at the frequency range of various you know singing voices here and think in terms of speech too like you know these are the, the frequency range kind of in the middle to the upper you know high mids here is really the most important for the frequency uh, for the frequencies that we're interested in, in dealing with for speech. Yeah, there's not a lot of speech content in the low frequencies or in the very high frequencies it's the mid range and the upper mid range that carries all the content and the meaning and the intelligibility. So, uh, whereas a music system can focus on a lot of bass and a lot of treble, in speech it's the opposite. We really want mid range to yeah, get right. The bass and the treble can often uh, uh, interfere with speech intelligibility right. if there's too much of it. So, you have to watch out for that. And then down here again, you can see sort of related to amplitude again, as for various sound pressure level numbers, how those kind of relate to what you might hear. And note that again, average conversation at three feet is somewhere around, you know, between 60, 70 dB SPL or something like that. So, that's kind of what we're looking at as compared to, you know, say, uh, you know, rock music at 10 feet, which is in excess of 110 dB SPL, right? But that just kind of gives you a gauge for, you know, what we're looking at there in terms of levels. So let's look at the parts of a sound system here. Uh, you can see kind of a basic sort of diagram of what happens once the sound waves approach the microphone, the different components that they go through, and we'll kind of took a look at all these different parts. But something that's often overlooked is that there's more to a sound system than just the electronics. Um, people often forget that the room and the sound source itself do play a role here. Yeah, just like uh, you see that room in that picture there, the room has an effect on how sound waves behave in the room, and that in turn affects how the sound system performs in that room. And just in the same way that in a video conferencing room, the lighting dictates a large part of how people will look on camera, uh, whether the room is very reflective to sound waves, the size and volume of the room, uh, where the furniture is placed and what type of furniture, whether it's got people in it or not, uh, whether the noise from fans and air ducts and projectors and so forth is noticeable or not, all of those things can have a big impact on the sound quality that you get in that room. And in some cases, you might have a bunch of different options for sound system configuration, different microphone styles or placement or whatever, but depending on the room, some of those options might not work very well. And what typically happens is somebody will say, well, you know, we want to do X, and X might work great in a perfect room that's really quiet and non-reflective, but uh, it won't work so well in a room that's got some uh, noisy vents and uh, some real reflective windows and concrete and so forth. I mean, I choose the, the room that you're hearing uh, for this webinar on, on purpose because it's basically has, it's surrounded on three sides by a very absorptive sound deadening material, has a drop acoustical tile ceiling and is in the middle of the building away from uh, traffic noise and all of those, those other things. I mean, I could certainly use my office instead, but that's, you know, two glass walls and a concrete ceiling and air handling noise that is, you know, ridiculous in the train tracks and right next to train tracks and you my office shakes when the train comes by so you know would that be the ideal room to do you know, this webinar from probably not you'd notice a lot different sound quality than what you're getting here so again the room will have can have a huge uh, impact and are there more you know processors and things that can help remove some of that noise and deal with some of that yes there are but it's you're usually better off trying to get it as right as you can acoustically first and not depending on the processing to try and fix that stuff and then we talk about the source and when we were talking before about the average sound pressure levels when it comes to talkers everybody's a little different but 
overall, most people are pretty much the same. People tend to talk at a certain level, and we know how sound waves propagate in, in air, and so we can predict what the sound level will be a certain distance away from a talker because uh, it decays uh, following a, a rule called the inverse square law, so there's a six decibel drop every time you double the distance. And if we know what the starting volume is, it's pretty easy to predict uh, at what point it will uh, decay by how much. Um, now, all that is well and good, but what's, what's working against us is the residual level of background noise or room reverberation that's present in the room. And at some point, the level of the talker's voice is going to fade to the point where it sinks into that mud of the noise and reverberation. And that's the, that's the distance we need to avoid uh, getting farther from. Um, in, in a studio, that distance might be quite far away from the, micro, from the talker, but uh, in a typical room, uh, you know, we're usually talking something within arm's reach or, or not much further than that as a, as a decent working distance. Since a lot of people don't necessarily know what it means when you talk, when you say a 60 dB doubling of distance, perhaps we can actually sort of mimic that a little bit. So I'm going to start. What am I about two inches from the microphone here, Chris? Right. So now I'm going to, tr I'm going to. This is not very accurate. I don't have a ruler, but I'm going to approximately double my distance. So what do you think about there now? Yeah, that maybe right? a little more. Yeah, right? and a little further back. Mm -hmm. So that's a 60 dB drop. Now if I double that again, now I'm probably back here. That's another 60 dB drop. So right. hopefully you can tell the difference between here and here and here, how much difference it makes when you're from a, a certain distance from the microphone, right? And as it says here, microphones are lazy, or you might even say microphones are dumb, because they're perfectly happy to pick up anything. They're not able to discriminate between noise and the intended source, which is why being within that critical distance is so important. And again, as Chris mentioned, the better the room, the more sound deadening material it has, and the quieter it is, the the greater that critical distance is going to be, but you'll hear us say this over and over again. The cheapest and easiest way to improve the performance of your sound system is keep the microphones as close to the source as possible. Right. And make sure the source knows what they're doing. When we talk about microphone polar patterns in a little bit, you'll see how it's important that the source, the source being the human using the microphone, has some idea of what they're doing with the microphone so that they don't talk at it from the side like this, but they talk at it in front of the microphone and what a big difference that makes when you're actually on axis with the microphone and things like that. You know, you have to, the source needs to be aware of the fact that you know, they're using a tool and they need to know how to use the tool. So now moving into the electronic side of things, the first thing, of course, you encounter is the inputs, which, you know, primarily we're going to talk about microphones, but they could be anything that you connect into the sound system, whether it's a microphone or the output of your laptop or the output of your phone if you're trying to play back some music or some sound samples or something off of your phone. These are all things that can provide input to the sound system. But, of course, all the, those other electronic devices tend to perform provide more of a, you know, it's a consistent electronic signal. When you have a microphone and the user of the microphone interacting, there tends to be a lot more variance there. So let's take a look at the microphone. Microphone itself has, has one job as a transducer, which is something that takes one form of energy and turns it into another form of energy. The microphone's job is to pick up acoustical energy or sound waves and change them into a electrical signal that can be used for whatever purposes the sound system needs at that point. And one way to differentiate microphones is on the operating principle, which is how they actually uh, take that sound wave and transduce it or change it into that um, into uh, into the varying voltage. So we'll start with the dynamic microphone because it is a a, a ubiquitous and very simple device. They're very common uh, for a lot of applications. They tend to be uh, very inexpensive and uh, and very rugged and uh, just a reliable, good tool, and they sound pretty good for the most part. Uh, if you take a look inside a dynamic microphone, you'll see that this is pretty much all there is to it. You've got a diaphragm, which is a very thin layer of mylar and a voice coil of wire attached to it, glued to the back of it, and that's suspended in a magnetic field. When sound waves strike the diaphragm, it vibrates back and forth, causing that coil to move in the magnetic field, and through the properties of induction, a electric current is induced in that coil, and then the wires coming off the coil go to the output connector of the microphone, and 
that's pretty much it. There's not a whole lot to a dynamic microphone, and that's partially why they're so inexpensive and so rugged. But there are some limitations. Dynamic microphones have to be of a certain size to really uh, to really sound good and, and work well. So um, if you're looking for you know lavalier or ear set headset microphones or something tiny that you can hide or be unobtrusive, dynamic microphones are not known for being unobtrusive, right? They're kind of they're out there, uh, and you see them. And they tend to have a limited sensitivity as well as compared to other types of mics like a condenser microphone, which we'll talk about next. Um, just the, the mass of the dynamic element in and of itself takes a little bit more energy to get it moving. Therefore, it's not as sensitive, which means you tend to need to be a little bit closer to them. They don't work as well for more distant pickup. And the frequency response can be somewhat limited as well. The sound quality you can achieve with a dynamic microphone may not be quite as good as what you can achieve with a condenser microphone type. Condenser microphones work on a, on a different principle, and they can be made much smaller, like for lavalier and ear set microphones like you see here, or maybe gooseneck microphones, right? They're much smaller, and they're typically more sensitive as well, uh, which means that for a given input level, you get more output signal from the microphone itself. Uh, one of the reasons they are more sensitive is because there's just not as much mass to the, to the diaphragm. There's no coil of wire hanging off the back of it. It's just a, 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 a metal uh, layered piece of mylar is typically what the diaphragm is made of, and that's suspended um, very close to an electrically charged back plate. So there's a little a spacer in there that keeps the, the uh, diaphragm from striking the back plate. But when, um, when a sound wave uh, strikes the diaphragm, the diaphragm moves again back and forth. Uh, changing the spacing of that electric field that it, it shares with the back plate, and then you end up with um, a again a electric current, a varying voltage that can be um, used or is uh, I want to say transmitted, but sent to the sound system. And the thing about condenser microphones is that they are somewhat more delicate and more expensive, but again they can be more sensitive and also have wider ranging flatter frequency response. Ultimately, they can sound more natural than a dynamic microphone can. And again, the miniaturization is kind of an important thing there. Condenser microphones also have additional electronics that you have to keep in mind. It's called a preamp circuit that is required with a condenser microphone. And this preamp requires power in order to operate. So if you're familiar with or heard the term phantom power, that is a voltage that is supplied typically by the mixer or whatever device the microphone is plugged into that powers those electronics. If your next device in the chain doesn't have phantom power or it's not turned on, then that microphone won't work. And that's a very common uh, question that we'll get here from someone who's, you know, calls up because they just bought a condenser microphone that they think is broken because they plug in a dynamic mic and it works just fine. Plug in the condenser mic, I don't get anything. It's usually not because the microphone's broken, it's because the phantom power hasn't been turned on or, or isn't present. So let's look at the directional patterns of the microphone now. Um, this refers to how microphones respond to sound arriving at different angles to the microphone. And broadly, you can put this into two different categories, either omnidirectional, which means it picks up sound from all directions, or unidirectional, meaning it picks up sound from one direction. And of the unidirectional types, by far the most popular is the cardioid pattern, which gets its name from, if you look at it, it kind of looks like an upside down heart. So like cardio, that's why, that's why it's called cardioid, um, and that means that this type picks up sound from one direction, what would be kind of zero degrees on axis here, and its angle of greatest rejection would be directly the back of the microphone, or 180 degrees off axis here. And there are some differences in characteristics between the two microphones, but again, the most important thing to keep in mind is how it responds to sound coming at it from different angles. So you might think to yourself, well, the Omni seems like it would be easiest because then I can just, I don't even have to worry about which way the microphone is pointing, it will always pick me up. And that's true, and that can be useful in certain applications. In other applications, though, you may not want the microphone picking up everything. Um, Chris and I are sitting right next to each other here. If we had omnidirectional microphones, we might each be each being picked up by each other's microphone more than we would want. Or if you have loudspeakers close by to the person using the microphone, if that microphone picks up the sound from that loudspeaker easily, you're more likely to get into a feedback loop, which we're going to talk about more a little bit later on. So a lot of background noise in the room, and Omni's going to pick up more of that. Too. Right. If it's a noisy room, that could be a problem. So you see several different directional patterns there, like supercardioid, hypercardioid, and even bidirectional. And each one of those gets progressively narrower in the working pickup angle in the front of the microphone, but then starts to have a lobe of pickup at the rear of the microphone also, which is a side effect of making the front of the pattern tighter. Um, the key thing, though, is that 
while those patterns are sometimes used in, in musical or broadcast applications, they're not real widely used in a lot of uh, meeting and speaking applications just because uh, the pattern gets tighter and it becomes more difficult for the user to stay in the working part of the pattern. You have to be more disciplined uh, and more controlled about where you are in relation to the microphone. Sometimes that's okay, but for a lot of users, that's that's really just too much to be thinking about. Right. So usually it's either omnidirectional or cardioid that you find in most of these microphones. And omnidirectional would be applicable for microphones that are very close to the sound source, so like the ear set mics that you might see people use that just come down over the ear and down the cheek very close to the mouth. Omnidirectional is, is great for that. Um, but if you're talking about, again, a, a gooseneck microphone or a boundary microphone that's further away on the table, then Omni may not be as appropriate for that application. And a very common misconception sometimes with omnidirectional microphones is that it solves the problem of the, uh, the, the wandering talker. Sometimes people will put a gooseneck mic on a cardioid pattern gooseneck mic on a podium and CEO or whoever happens to be sitting there in front of the podium wanders around and goes off to the side and is always moving back and forth and so they say, you know, that cardioid is two directional, I'd really like to get an omni. Well, if the problem is that you just are getting way off access to the side, the omni is not going to help so much. That just means you're going to get picked up behind the microphone too. So unless the person moves around the back of the podium and is talking into the back of the microphone, that doesn't really help you there. So you You've also got the problem of if they get off to the side of the podium, they're no longer speaking at the microphone really anymore either. So right. even if you do pick up sound, it'll have a different character now because you're, you're, you're not picking up from the front of the face, you're picking up from the side of the head, which has a, a, got a different tonality to it. Right. So moving into frequency response, this is really just refers to how the microphone sounds. You Speaking can, of tonality. Tonality, yes. Um, and the uh, you can you can graph this out on a chart, or what you see here, the frequency response uh, graph, which shows frequency across the bottom and the output level of the microphone uh, going vertically here. And so what we're looking at here is what we call a flat frequency response microphone because the response of it when you graph it out looks like a flat line and that basically means that for any given frequency that the microphone is picking up the output of the microphone remains consistent uh, across the board and um, that that's good that would be this would be considered a very a good sounding flat microphone but that may not necessarily always be what you want. Uh, again, particularly if you're looking for something like speech and you want to emphasize the human speech range, you're picking up a lot of low frequency information down here that you may not need. The human voice doesn't really produce much energy below 100 hertz unless you're the, the bass singer in a gospel choir maybe. So for most speaking applications, you're just getting noise and rumble and vibration and things that aren't really necessary down here. And same thing really goes for speech. Again, above 10K, uh, 10,000 hertz, you know, there are things there that might make in certain, you know, high-end recording applications sound more natural if you include it. But again, for purposes of speech reinforcement, you don't really need that information. The human brain doesn't that doesn't help intelligibility at all. So that's why we also have shaped frequency response microphones, which, uh, again, called shaped because it's a shaped line, right? But it, um, it you, what you'll notice here is that the output of the microphone is, is greater at some frequencies, and you actually get less output at other frequencies. So this kind of microphone would be great for speech because it rolls off s stuff below 100 hertz that you really don't need and has what we call a presence peak up here between like 2 and 5K, where the microphone is actually more sensitive. And this is useful because this is where consonant sounds are in human speech, and the consonants are what allow us to understand each other. So by kind of emphasizing the consonant range here, you've employed a microphone that will only help increase the intelligibility. Electrical output, um, we're going to go through this rather quickly, but it's important to understand it because it has implications as far as what are you connecting the microphone to, or really what are you connecting anything to in your audio system. Right. All the, anything that has to connect electrically from one device to the other, you have to know a little bit something about those devices to, to determine whether or not it's going to work, or if it doesn't work, try to figure out why it's not working. And every uh, microphone has a, a characteristic output level for a certain amount of sound going in, and we call that the sensitivity. And it's also got a characteristic electrical impedance, which really is only important as far as goes uh, its interconnection with other pieces of equipment and is usually not the most important thing. Uh, and then wiring configuration, that one comes up a lot. In That's other words, uh, is the signal uh, you know, on one wire with one ground connection or is it two wires with ground and how is that configured? Again, 
not in itself a critical thing, but it matters when you start to patch different types of equipment together. Right. In the digital realm, there's a lot more standardized configuration where USB is wired a certain way, FireWire is a certain way with defined signal levels. Um, as somebody liked to joke, you know, the great thing about the analog audio world is there are so many standards to choose from. So <laughs> there isn't just one. Right. So just to kind of taking a little bit closer look at sensitivity here, just to kind of give you an idea, the, the important point, the, the takeaway for you here is that it's not consistent. All audio devices uh, can vary, although there's some sort of generic buckets you can kind of throw them in, and they, we refer to those as mic level, line level, and uh, something that's called auxiliary level, which is sort of also known as consumer line level. So audio devices that you might go buy at, at Best Buy or whatever might, you know, for your your home your home CD stereo player. equipment, CD players and whatnot would be considered uh, an auxiliary level device. Um, and the reason that you see negative numbers on the decibel scale there is because uh, decibel is always working off of. Uh, of a reference, right? And in this case, the the reference is sort of the line output of a mixer, which we consider zero. And so anything that's less than that is, of course, going to have a negative number attached to it. So that's why the numbers go down as uh, well with negative and with in the negative range as you get lower in level. So microphones, you'll notice, are you know somewhere between, depending on whether it's a dynamic or a condenser microphone, around 50, 40, 50 dB less than a, a line level output of a mixer. So that that's why when you're connecting a microphone to something else, you need to know that the input you're going to is a designed to accept a microphone level signal. If it doesn't have, you know, 50 dB of gain or so at its mic input, then guess what? You're not going to get a whole lot of signal, if anything at all, right? So you ha you have to know these things. Vice versa, if you've got something that has uh, aux level consumer output, which is fairly high level signal, and you try to connect that to a microphone input, you're probably going to have distortion because you're going to be overloading that input. So you have to you have to kind of look at these things and and you know, be aware of them when you're trying to connect devices. And here's just a, a, a variety of different connector types that you might encounter in sound systems, and we now include the USB connector there as, uh, as a potential connector that would be used for audio purposes, even though it's really digital at that point. But the XLR connector on the far left is what's typically used for professional microphones. It has three pins. It's what's called a, provides what's called a balanced signal if it's wired that way. Again, the most important thing to note here is that you cannot look at a connector and know how it's wired just by looking at the connector type. Right. right. Um, but then moving across the USB connector, then we've got uh, the quarter-inch phone plug. Um, this particular one has uh, is what's called a TRS or tip ring sleeve. These little black lines are insulators that allow you actually have three electrical connection points here. So really, it could be wired like in a balanced configuration like the XLR, but maybe not. Uh, just depends. And then you have the 3.5 millimeter mini plug here. This is also a TRS type connector. Looks a lot like the headphone uh, plug on your earbuds or whatever. And then the RCA phono connector, which is very commonly used in consumer audio devices. But can you just look at this and know that that's aux level and unbalanced? Be a pretty good guess. That's mostly how it used. But again, you cannot ever directly associate a connector with a particular wiring configuration and a signal level. So a question we get all the time is, uh, you know, can I plug my microphone into X device? And the answer is, well, that depends. Um, in fact, we have an FAQ on our website that you can look for that spells out exactly what are the things you need to know about X device before we can have a hope of telling you whether or not it's going to work. Right. It would be nice if audio was completely plug and play and anything with an XLR could connect to anything else with an XLR, but you don't necessarily know that. And if you're going to something that has a mini plug input, like your computer or your camera, who knows, right? So you might be able to go down, well, I guess you can't go down to Radio Shack anymore, but at some point you could go down to Radio Shack. You could probably buy an adapter cable that would get you from XLR to mini plug. Does that mean it's going to work? You don't know until you try it. But knowing some of these specifications will help you figure that out. And one of the frustrating things for people who get into AV is that 
in a lot of cases, professional audio equipment will use XLR connectors and have certain signal levels and, and wiring schemes. Uh, but then when you move into some other piece of equipment, maybe a, a video conferencing rollabout cart or something like that or some type of recording system, uh, they might have chosen a completely different wiring scheme and a different plug uh, input style just because it's cheaper because those connectors are a whole lot cheaper than XLR connectors are. So that's why you can buy a multi-thousand dollar video conferencing rig that's got a cheap 15 cent mini plug connector as the audio input to it. Connecting to a computer provides a different, well, it's actually it's a similar set of challenges, I guess, because the audio input on most computers, again, is usually some sort of 3.5 millimeter mini plug, and how it's wired is, is anybody's guess. So when people want to connect a computer, a microphone to their computer, the best way to go is really avoid that analog input and just go straight to the USB input through a analog to digital converter that provides either a USB, Firewire, Thunderbolt, or whatever it happens to be type of uh, interface your computer has. There are many such devices on the market. There are even some microphones that have built in uh, digital uh, analog to digital converters that will connect directly to your computer. But right, if you go we make to, some of those with a dedicated USB output. Right. And we also have XLR to USB converters, right, which can take a microphone and provide that signal which will get into the computer. And then you avoid all those issues with the unknown quantities of the analog input that is typically provided on computers. And then of course you have to consider the physical design of the microphone. It seems kind of obvious, but you know what you're doing with it determines whether or not you want to go with a gooseneck microphone or a handheld microphone or a, a lavalier ear set microphone, whatever. There's microphones come in all different shapes and sizes. You just have to choose the right one for the application. So moving on now to the next part of the signal chain is mixers and signal processors. And we could go on for hours and hours and hours about all of the different types of processors that are out there, but we'll try to kind of keep this discussion focused on the real problem solvers in this category, which are automatic mic mixers, feedback reducers, and echo cancelers. You know, there are, there are equalizers, there's dynamics processors, and all kinds of other things that can be used to sort of enhance and shape the sound and make it more pleasing, but you kind of have to address these other issues first or the rest of that stuff is not, um, not as helpful. The mixer, of course, is kind of the, the real heart of the operation here because all of your input sources get routed through the mixer where those levels are uh, amplified and balanced and kind of mixed together and then routed to whatever the different audio output devices or recording devices happen to be. And then the other function of the mixer, which is important, is adjusting the what's called the gain structure of the system and this is an area where you know if someone doesn't know what they're doing you can get into a, a lot of trouble um, but at the mixer this is where you can make those adjustments where you can you know the, the goal is to kind of bring everything up to some sort of a nominal level where it's it's loud enough that you're not operating near the noise floor of the different devices all electronic audio devices have a noise floor which you, you can hear if you're not your gain structure isn't set up correctly but not so loud that you're getting distortion, right? If you see red lights indicating clipping, if you're seeing your meters pegged, that means that you have too much signal level there, and that's not necessarily a good thing either. So you have to kind of strike that delicate balance between loud enough so that it's not causing distortion, but not so quiet that you know the signal ends up being noisy. And that just comes from experience, learning how to do that, but the mixer is sort of the place where you would accomplish that. We have a specialized type of mixer that can be beneficial, which is an automatic mixer. Right, and an automatic mixer just does essentially what a sound engineer would do, which is to turn off the microphones that don't need to be on, or at least turn them down, which or attenuate them, um, and automatically turn microphones on based on some criteria. Somebody's talking, or there's sufficient sound level at the microphone, or whatever. Um, and then as a secondary uh, function, they give you more control functions maybe to uh, create priorities of, of one microphone or uh, over another and maybe uh, have some microphones be activated automatically and others be on all the time or whatever, depending on the nature of the installation. But an automatic mixer actually has some important advantages uh, because, number one, by eliminating uh, microphones that don't need to be on, you reduce the NOM or the number of open microphones. And that's important because every additional microphone that's turned up 
picks up additional background noise and room reverberation. So if it doesn't need to be on to capture a nearby person's voice, it should be turned off. Uh, also, when you have multiple microphones on at the same time picking up the same sound source, um, all those uh, signals fill, uh, add together and uh, subtly interact with each other and cause what's called comb filtering because the shape of that graph looks sort of like the teeth of a comb, which gives it sometimes a slightly hollow or tin can kind of sound. It kind of um, starts to sound like this, actually. Right. It's not, it's not a, a do or die sort of thing, but it definitely can be annoying after a while. And the more mics you have, the worse it is. So in, in general, um, when we're talking about multiple microphones, you can hear the effects between even four open mics and one open mic. But anytime you start talking about six or eight or more microphones than that, then you either need to be thinking about an automatic mixer or a sound engineer to manually do it, which might be difficult or impossible, or having a manual button on each microphone where the talker handles their own microphone activation, which sometimes works and sometimes is not practical. A good automatic mixer should be basically transparent. You shouldn't ever notice that it's working and hear you know, parts of speech being clipped off or anything like that. So if you've never heard an automatic mixer before and we're thinking that you wouldn't want to use one because that's the case, you're hearing one now on this webinar because all of our mics are being routed through uh, an SCMA 20 automatic mic mixer there. So you can kind of get a, get a sense of uh, you know, what kind of audio quality you can get through these. Now, feedback is another story. Um, if you were on last month's uh, webinar, you this is a bit of a review for you, but those of you who didn't get a chance to tune in that, uh, that I, well, actually, I encourage you to go um, listen to that webinar, which is um, archived on our training page at sure.com. But just real quickly, um, remember that feedback is caused when the output of the uh, loudspeaker, well, let, let me back up. When you speak into a microphone and that, and your voice is processed through the system and comes out through the loudspeaker and is picked up by that same microphone again, that is the, the chain of events that leads to feedback occurring, which again is howling, squealing, annoying sound. Everyone's heard it, uh, particularly in movies where they like to use that as a sound effect to show the microphone is working. You hear a little squeak of feedback. Um, in real life that sh shouldn't be happening, but uh, but sometimes it does, and that's why it occurs. It occurs whenever the uh, sound level at the loudspeaker is greater than the sound level coming from the talker back at the microphone diaphragm or the front of the microphone, right? These are the conditions with, with which feedback occurs. Um, the, I guess, quickest way to eliminate that feedback would be to just turn down your sound system, and then you won't hear the feedback anymore, but there are some other ways it can be dealt with. A processor that helps with that is something called an automatic feedback reducer, which is really nothing more than an equalizer that automatically deploys filters at the appropriate frequencies to, uh, to, to, to get rid of that particular feedback at that particular frequency. Um, we try to re refrain from referring to these devices as um, eliminators or destroyers because you can never 100% of the time guarantee that you're going to eliminate feedback, but they certainly can be effective tools in reducing feedback. However, there are really some things you should do before you automatically reach for the electronic solution. As we've said before, keep the microphone close to the talker. The closer the microphone is to your mouth, the less amplification is required, the less likely it is that you're going to get into a feedback situation. You can also move the microphone closer to the listener. Not quite as easy as moving the microphone closer to the talker, but a potential solution. Move the loudspeaker closer loudspeaker. to the listener. Loudspeaker, sorry, that's what I meant. Thank you. Um, and then uh, reduce the number of open microphones. The more microphones you have turned on, the more likely it is that you're going to get feedback. Again, this is where the automatic mixer helps by removing that number of open microphones factor or keeping the number of open mics always equal to one. That also um, increases the likelihood that you're going to have enough gain before feedback. Obviously, keeping the mics and loudspeakers separate from each other can be helpful. Using directional microphones will give you a little bit of a benefit versus omnidirectional. And then finally, we get down to using a, a, an equalizer or automatic feedback reducer to, um, to help get rid of that, any last little stray bits of feedback you might have. So the processor is helpful, maybe shouldn't necessarily be the first thing that you reach for. And those are the solutions. The last one we want to talk about here is the echo canceller. Um, the reason you need this device is in a conferencing situation. So you have a participant in one room and a talker in another room, and they need to hear each other as they talk back and forth. Without an echo canceller, what ends up happening is 
when the person over on the right here speaks and their microphone signal goes out through whatever bridges or VoIP system or the, the, and the internet and all of these things that are going to delay the signal and then it comes out through the loudspeaker in the far room and then that talker's voice gets picked up by the listener's microphone here, it gets transmitted back to their room and they hear it as an echo of their own voice. Right? That can be extremely distracting. There's almost no way to hold yeah, Just like feedback, that's that's one of the call somebody problems where it's like this is going to derail the meeting. Right. We can't have a conversation like this anymore. So what the echo canceller does for you is basically listens to the sound. Actually, this blue line should also be shown being feeding the echo canceller here from the talker. The, the echo canceller gets to hear the incoming audio from the far side before it goes to the loudspeaker. Then when the microphone picks up that same talker's voice coming out of the loudspeaker and compares it to what came into the room and says, oh, this is the same thing, that it electronically cancels out that signal and doesn't transmit it back to the far side. So the echo is therefore effectively canceled. Now the kind of thing that some people have a hard time wrapping their brains around here is the echo canceller on this side benefits the original talker. So you really have to have an echo canceller on both sides to prevent either side from hearing echo in the conversation or to have a, a full duplex meeting. I and guess. the irony of it is that if you're hearing echo, it's the other person's fault. Right. Because it means right. they need an echo canceller because they're allowing your voice to come back to you. And same way, if they're hearing echo, it means you need an echo canceller, right. which is sometimes difficult to deal with. So that's um, a little bit about mixers and processors. Then, of course, you get to the far end, and now we're dealing with amplifiers and loudspeakers, which are pretty much, you know, for the most part, single-purpose devices. An amplifier just exists to provide a high level to drive loudspeakers, and the loudspeaker does the reverse of a microphone and takes the electrical energy and converts it back into sound waves so that we can hear again. Um, sometimes these devices are combined into one box, referred to as a powered loudspeaker, meaning the amplifier is built into it, so you don't need a separate amplifier. In almost all cases, these devices are line level only. And what does that mean? That means that you can't take a microphone and plug it directly into a powered loudspeaker with a line level input. That's where the mixer comes into play again, because the mixer helps provide line level signals to whatever devices you need to go to as well. So again, you always have to keep those sorts of things in mind. Just a quick word about digital audio before we wrap up here and um, take some questions from you. Uh, as we're getting into the digital audio world, um, you just want to note that there's, you know, audio is, is, is audio. We're all, you know, trying to hear things in the same way. But when you talk about digital audio, what you're doing here is basically sampling an analog waveform. And the parameters that you see surrounding digital audio have to do with things like sampling frequency, which is how often you take a snapshot of that audio. So in what's considered CD quality, they use a sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz, which is essentially saying 44,000 times a second they take a little picture, if you want to call it that, or a sample of that waveform. And then the bit depth refers to how many bits, how many little pieces of information are assigned to that sample. So in a 16-bit um, scenario, that means that you have 16 bits that are assigned to that individual sample. And that's what we would consider CD quality. That was determined back at the dawn of the CD era, that that was good enough for most people that couldn't really hear a difference from analog. Of course, we could debate that for hours, but we're not going to. Uh, but those are that's what ends up happening when you get to digital audio. And that sort of emerged as kind of the standard digital audio format for most equipment. It might have a selection of different settings, but almost every digital piece of audio gear has that. Right. Choice of settings. You might see 24 bit, 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz. You know, right. these are other values. But that's that are sort out of there. The, the, the common language between all of them. Mm -hmm. And now there's something called networked digital audio, which is uh, advantageous for getting rid of the miles and miles of individual discrete copper connections that are required in an analog system. So, with an, any analog systems, you have to be routing a, uh, a, a, a single dedicated cable or wire for every signal. Everyone is discrete. And then these get plugged into what's referred to as a snake, and these giant bundles of wires are sent routed from place to place, and they break 
got at the other end and you connect all these discrete signals into your mixer, et cetera, et cetera. And it can be heavy and expensive and has lots of connection points that could potentially fail. So when you get into networked digital audio systems, you can um, you can use sort of standardized, you know, cabling like Cat5 or Cat6 cable um, to carry networked digital audio around. And there's some different standards that are out there, but mostly what you're starting to see now is the uh, uh, the proliferation of audio over Ethernet type connections, uh, in particular looking up at like layer three type connections like Dante, which it can run on existing Ethernet networks. The same system that's handling your company email and your internet can also handle your digital audio network as well. Um, some of these other ones like Ethernet and Cobra Sound require their um, their own uh, dedicated network, and some of the what they call layer one um, networks, meaning they they use Cat5e and Cat6 cable, it looks like Ethernet, but it's really not. It just happens to be sharing the same physical structure. But these are all um, becoming popular now. And again, it's to kind of drive the benefit home. Instead of having like eight wireless mic channels connected to a mixer with eight microphone cables, you could just, if they have a digital audio networking built into them, run it over an Ethernet network that connects to a mixer that is also networkable. And it's much simpler in terms of cabling. So um, again, there can be cost savings there. Uh, there, there can you can manage all your connection points by software instead of having to physically patch them. Uh, and it, one of the main things is that it actually can be improved audio quality because problems that you have with analog connections like hum, ground loops, those sorts of things are really not present in a network digital audio solution if it's correctly implemented. So there really can be. Um, a lot of uh, benefits to that system and as again as an IT uh, person you would want to be aware of these systems and be able to communicate with the audio people about how this may or may not impact your network. That makes it really easy to reconfigure a large system if you say I want the audio from this room to be heard in that room or you know reconfigure equipment from different locations it's really easy in the digital domain. Mm -hmm. So real quickly, um, before we get to questions, if you have any questions, remember you can enter them in the question pane that is in your webinar control panel there. do want to uh, refer you to our latest educational publication, which is the Audio Systems Guide for Meetings and Conferences. It's available in PDF format from the long link you see there, but I'm sure if you search for it on the SURE website, you'll be able to find it. And don't forget about our FAQ, which has thousands of questions and answers on it. You can research just about any audio topic or SURE product related topic you can imagine there. So all kinds of good information there. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Cheryl to see if there's uh, any questions we can answer. Actually, we don't have many questions. So if you have any, now is the time to get them in. Um, in the meantime, we do have one. Uh, the President of the United States always has great audio. Do they use special mics or are there other tricks that they use? Ooh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, they use a very special microphone. <laughs> the most special. The most special. It is referred to, you may, you may have heard of it, it's called the Shure SM57. Uh, it is it's a dynamic microphone. Uh, it is a great sounding microphone. And wait a minute, it, wait a minute. Isn't that the same microphone that I see on my rehearsal space on my guitar player's guitar cabinet? It is the very same microphone. Nah. Yes. And, and he and he likes that mic because if he needs another one, he can pick one up at any guitar center anywhere in the country. It's convenient. Exactly. No, but uh, and that is one of the reasons they use it. But you know, you'll notice though, it always sounds great. And one of the reasons it sounds great is the president has very good microphone technique. He's not wandering around. He's not talking way over here and then talking way over here. He's still very steady, right in front of the microphones, and it picks him up and it sounds great. And we should also point out one of the advantages of a dynamic microphone in that type of a podium application, since a lot of times on podiums you see condenser gooseneck mics, and that is that a dynamic mic is virtually impervious to moisture and humidity, and even rain in many cases. And in his particular situation, he does a lot of events outdoors. Um, the stuff is flown to a location in a cargo plane. It's extremely cold. It gets unpacked. You know, uh, at an airport in Houston in the middle of summer, it's 100 degrees and 90% humidity. You're going to have condensation. Maybe you're going to have weather issues. Uh, condenser microphones sometimes don't like those kinds of conditions. Dynamic microphones keep working pretty much unless they're underwater. If, if you're in a situation where you can't control your environment and the microphone can't fail, 
then a dynamic microphone is is really a great a great way to go. Right. So it definitely. And people sometimes ask why two microphones, and the answer is one microphone feeds the PA system for sound reinforcement for the, the local audience there, and the second microphone is used at its own level setting specifically for recording. So whether they turn the PA system up, down, or off, they always have a dedicated microphone for recording for historical purposes. Yeah, that's, that, that's a great example, but watch the mic technique. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, this gentleman tends to deal with more feedback when he's using his ULX-D1 with lav mics in the meeting room as compared to with the handheld Beta 87A mics. Is this mainly due to mic placement? Well, if you think about it, what, we, what, what, what did we say our number one reason was, or number one way to uh, get better gain before feedback? Keep the microphone as close as you can to the sound source. Where's the lavalier microphone? Down the middle of your chest somewhere, you know, maybe I don't know, eight to ten inches from your mouth, uh, versus you know, a handheld mic. Now, depending on how the mic technique, but typically the handheld mic, if you're using it correctly, is going to be up closer to your mouth, right in front of your mouth, instead of you know, down underneath your chin, below your chest. So you're typically, uh, or in the middle of your chest. So you're typically going to have to add a lot more gain to get a good level with the lavalier microphone, which is only going to aggravate the feedback situation, which is why we're such big fans of the ear set microphones because now the microphone is very close to your mouth. You can use an Omni and it's fine and you'll get all the, the gain that you ever need um, without feedback. And also, there's the polar pattern issue too because the Beta 87 is a super cardioid. It's very tight so polar pattern. So very, very good feedback rejection. A lot of lavaliers are omnidirectional, so this, this person might be using an omnidirectional lavalier, which means the Beta 87 definitely has an edge. Even if it's a directional lavalier, like a, a cardioid or supercardioid, it's still the handheld is probably going to have the edge in performance. And that's why if you, if you need that feedback rejection of a handheld, but you need the hands-free performance of a lavalier, the ear set is probably the best compromise. And that's why you see so many of them on Broadway shows now. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it's funny if you think about. It, I think something we pointed out in in the last webinar is the history of the lavalier microphone. It was really designed for broadcast applications, for a newscaster could wear it and read the news hands free and not have a microphone in front of their face. And there, feedback's not a consideration because the microphone is going out to broadcast, and the loudspeaker right. is on your television set miles away at your house. So you're not going to have a feedback scenario. But the attractiveness of the hands-free was, of course, a big reason people started using it for sound reinforcement. But again, as you know, a lot of theater applications, it's ear set mics, or even if it's a, a lob, it's you know, it's taped to the cheek, or it's in the wig, or taped to the middle of the forehead. It's somewhere closer to the mouth than, you know, clipped to your tie. So it's it's to be expected. Um, and again, you know, the, the ways we talked about are the ways to deal with it. Great. Okay, um, question here about training. Will there be any further more advanced webinars planned for the future that cover the IT side like this? Uh, well, I guess that depends on if they're asking about more IT-based webinars, which, again, we did kind of a basic one uh, about a year ago, which is available for archival purposes that gets in sort of the basics of IT. Um, whether or not we do a more advanced one seems likely because that's only become, going to become um, more prevalent. Uh, if you're looking for more advanced audio training, um, again, We've got, what, three or four years worth of webinars archived at this point, so if you haven't been there yet, definitely take a look and see. Um, and if you have suggestions for, you know, some specific topics you'd like to see covered, please email us at the address you see there, training underscore us at sure.com. Um, send, send any ideas you have or suggestions on over, and we'll, we'll definitely consider them. Definitely. All right, that about wraps up our time. Um, we didn't quite get to every question, but if you have a question that you want to ask, you can send an email to support at sure.com or call the product support number you see on that final slide there. Um, we want to thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next month.